Now the focus of this presentation is on literary representations thematically associated with 1947. I'm kind of overviewing uh, what most of the people have been saying that this is what 1947 literature is about, for instance, in the work through the works of Manto. Um, my doctoral research and publication has been on Saraiki writers. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about it later on. Uh, but uh, what I've done in for this presentation is that I've tried to expand on the things which I have not looked at on during my, the course of my research on Saraiki. And one of the most important things was that how 1971 has impacted the writers. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I also want us to think about um, what is the relevance or irrelevance of partitions. We always talk about, when, when we look at partition literature, we always talk about um, how the writers are influenced by it. But we, we've never, I guess, d discussed things like, why are the writers quiet about partition? There are certain regional languages, for instance, Saraiki, in which the writers are not actually directly referring to partition, whether it's 1947 or 71. And then I finally conclude by shifting connotations of the term partition. Just to give you a little bit context of my research, um, I'm going to say this in Saraiki, which is my mother language, because I've spent this whole morning listening to Bengali, and I love the sound of it. So just to explain a little bit of my doctoral research, you can see the uh, overview there that um, um, my doctoral thesis, uh, Saraiki, lang uh, lang uh, Saraiki Zuban De Utte Hai, Te Saraiki uh, Jadi Saraiki Shairi De Baare Chai. The uh, thesis which I discussed ki che, ki hai ki sarai ki shayar ki uh, resist in Pakistan ech political pressures, the government pressures. Ko. In other words, I looked at how sarai ki, contemporary sarai ki writers resist government and political pressures in Pakistan. Now, coming back to starting our discussion with partition, uh, if we look back at works like uh, Ice Candy Man, um, Train to Pakistan, or Manto's short stories, um, I guess we've all discussed that, and we agree on the fact that they're talking about trauma, memory, abductions, uh, religion versus nationalism, or mistreatment of women, most importantly, Hindu and Muslim divide. I was very interested in um, expanding my research on why um, 1971 is not discussed in Pakistan. Um, I teach in, in a private university, and we have really no issues with why, why we are teaching 1971 or 47. But surprisingly, I've never come across any good institution primarily teaching um, 1971 literature. So there is really no discussion, debate, or even concern about memorializing 1971. And unfortunately, the generation which faced this event is ending or is nearly voiceless. Um, one, of, uh, one or two people that I met recently since I started working in Pakistan, I, uh, I started talking to them about 1971 and their experiences. Uh, and they had nothing, they were so traumatized and either they wanted to talk a lot about it or they were silent. They wanted to, they, they were upset and they used to say, we cannot talk about it. Now. Coming away a little bit from academia, there is really no exchange of views, public level or state interact interactions between Pakistan and Bangladesh. Uh, I need to discover whether this is straight pressure that there should be no research or publication related to 1971 literature, or is there a lack of interest? Um, so Raiki literature about partition um, is this is interesting that Saraiki is an identity which kind of emerged in Pakistan after the creation of Bangladesh. And it's very much inspired by uh, Bangladesh movement and the idea of ethno-linguistic identity. So at the time when, uh, bef during colonization or before colonization, the language was not actually called Saraiki, but you know, British officials discovered discovered these various dialects, which were collectively called Saraiki after 1971. This was in 1973 or so, around that time. 
um, so basically sir, a serious Saraiki work on uh, work on Saraiki literature as an outcome of ethno-linguistic identity was done after 1971. So my research has actually based on uh, this kind of work and in, in fact very, very contemporary work, uh, short stories and poetry written after between 1990 and 2013. Now, uh, in other words, Saraiki nationalism is also um, this is a different way of looking at it that it is uh, basically Saraiki people are demanding a separate province in Pakistan and they're proposing the bifurcation of Punjab province. Um, although they, they claim that they have experienced a lot of dominations like uh, during pre-colonial uh, pre era, Mughal era, and there were a lot of Afghans and Mughals and so many people coming around that region and dominating them. But at the moment, the biggest debate is that uh, there is a gradual territorial, linguistic, economic, and political dominance of Punjabi and Mohajir ruling elite in, in the current Punjab. And most of the present con Punjab constitutes Saraiki speaking area. I'm going to show you the map in a minute. Um, despite the fact that contemporary writers do not address the event of partition directly, the understanding of Saraiki identity can still not be detached from the event of 1947 partition. So I'm going to talk about how uh, we cannot detach Saraiki identity and literature from 1947 and very importantly from 1971. Now, uh, there is this term used, Mohajir, for Urdu-speaking community, which migrated uh, from uh, India to Pakistan during 1947, and most of them reside in Karachi. Um, as you know, uh, MQM is a representative of that community. Uh, but they are kind of scattered, and they are based in Punjab, in Lahore, in Karachi. Uh, so the biggest grievance of Saraiki people is, uh, so let's, let's be clear about this, that when I say Punjabi and Mohajir, it does not mean every single Punjabi and every single Mohajir. The Saraiki people have this grievance against the Punjabi Mohajir ruling elite, uh, which they think is dominating them by uh, not giving them job quotas, not recognizing their language, not accepting them as a political identity, not agreeing them to give, uh, give them an independent province, and even using and utilizing their resources. So there, I'm just defining the Mohajir community. So basically, Mohajir community is kind of using the um, symbol of Islam and Urdu language and kind of creating a, a dominating position within Pakistan. Uh, now, this takes us to uh, the um, language, uh, the debate of language as a symbol of power. And I think in uh, during the case of Bangladesh, th this was the biggest issue that the language and ethnic identity was not being recognized. So, in some ways, these this, this settler community, Mohajir community, along with uh, Punjabi community or Punjabi Mohajir ruling elite, are kind of dominating this Saraiki area and language and kind of disregarding their um, political identity. I'm going to skip a few things. Uh, so. As we all know that all the provinces are made um, in Pakistan are based on languages like Sindh on uh, Sindh is based on the main languages Sindhi in Balochistan it's Balochi and in KPK Khyber Pakhtunkhwa it's Pashto but whereas Punjab is refusing to accept the existence of this another community which speaks this language and wants recognition. Now, the biggest in insecurity amongst Mohajir and uh, Punjabi ruling elite is that despite their nostalgic attachments to their motherlands, uh, neither the Punjabi nor pa Mohajir settlers in Pakistan can return to their original places of birth in pre-partitioned India from where their ancestors migrated. So there is this insecurity that they have to settle here and they have to maintain their politi political control. Now, how do Saraiki nationalists and writers challenge this domination? Now, I write their nationalists and writers because um, in my research, I'm trying to argue that what a political activist is doing, a Saraiki creative writer is also doing. Though they might not agree on uh, working together, 
but you know like the resistance is kind of similar so what they are doing is they are proposing and creating a map for a new province by overlapping uh, which is kind of overlapping the post partition map of punjab now i want you to see the image of this map Okay, now this is uh, the gray area that you see. You won't be able to see all the um, names of the districts, but there are 23 districts in Punjab which are being proposed and claimed as Saraiki province, and this is a map proposed by Saraiki activists. So now you can see the entire Punjab is really cut into a small piece, uh, and hence the debate that no, Saraiki is not a language and there shouldn't be uh, bifur there should be no bifurcation of punjab and there should be no fifth province in pakistan now it's interesting to note that a lot of um, when we talk about um, the immigrant identity or when we talk about partition we also think of uh, how people were imagining their homeland, you know, and the biggest, the most important thing was that they, they thought, okay, if we, if we have a separate country, we can have Islam as religion and Urdu as a language. I'm sorry, I have to cut down so many things. Uh, whereas the Saraiki uh, speakers are not actually thinking like that. They are saying that we have been living in this land and that's why we are claiming this province. So I have to go through this quickly, and I had a lot to say, and not sure how to cut it down. Just quickly wanted to say that during 1971, when Saraiki literary movement uh, came into existence, they were inspired and in touch with a lot of Bengal Bengali poets as well, and they were in organizing literary events. Uh, and kind of Kavi Jassimuddin was one of the poets who was uh, in touch with these activists. Now the questions that I, I was interested in, I'm going to just go to them quickly because I, I was going to talk about Sraiki poets too. But please talk about one poet. Rifat Abbas. I've got five minutes. <laughs> Okay, quickly, just to give an overview that some of the poets that I discuss in my research and I'm working on, they, um, for instance, Rifat Abbas. Now, Rifat Abbas is uh, inspired by uh, mus mi the mystic poet Khwaja Ghulam Farid, uh, who used to write kafis. Rifat say, claims that he's writing contemporary kafis, but if you read his kafis, there is no uh, mystic thought there. You know, all he's concerned about is the political identity and the political problems face faced in his region. Um, there is another po uh, writer who's written a uh, kind of an epic, and it's called Malohi Sada Sohagan. It's about uh, Multan city, and he talks about how historically the city is alive and always Sohagan, or, you know, historically uh, resisting all the uh, domination's that uh, it has experienced. Now, what I was really interested in talking about was that what is the mem I, this is a working paper. I don't have answers, but I have questions. And you know, I'm sure I'll gain some knowledge from the discussions here too. What is the memorial re relationship between 1947 and 71 in the minds of Saraiki writers? Now, secondly, despite being influenced by the two partitions, um, two divisions as a way of contributing towards, how have these d divisions contributed towards their collective or ethno-linguistic identity? Um, the other thing I want to, I'm interested in is, based on my supervisor Anania Kabir's theory of post-partition amnesia, my interest is how is the memory of 1971 integrated into the ways of constructing and maturing the Saraiki identity. Now I skipped that part where I wanted to talk about that Saraiki activists were, um, the whole argument about Saraiki province is kind of based on Bangladesh, you know, like that our language is not accepted, our, we've not given equal rights, we don't have a, a representation in the parliament. But why are the writers not mentioning then this in their works is what surprises me. Um, are these memories rejected or accepted by these writers or their next generations? Um, also interesting to note is that there is there was no, no uh, 
if there was no notion of collective identity during 1947. So we can't actually argue that why did Saraiki writers not write about 1947? And majority of people did not migrate to India. So in India, you will have like perhaps a community of 10 million who can speak Saraiki, but the language is actually dying because their next generations are not learning it. Uh, while Punjab has remained uh, an important focus in partition literature, why do writers in South Punjab intentionally avoid discussion about partition 1947 or 1971? And I'm really interested in Kabir's theory that what are our practices of placemaking, our reasons for intentional forgetting and painful remembering? Now, this, this is what really interests me, because if Saraiki um, political resistance came out of uh, or inspire, was inspired by 1971. So what is the reason? Are they intentionally forgetting or painfully remembering 1971 by not mentioning it in their uh, poetry? Um, I was just going to quickly go through. Th this, this is a, a, a public address by Jinnah. I wanted to end on this because um, I think what Saraiki writers and political activists are doing is totally against what Jinnah anticipated. He was saying that there should be no provin provincialism, and we are not, we, are, we don't, the, he was basically saying there are no ethnicities, and let's just be Muslims, and let's just speak Urdu. And whatever is happening in Pakistan is totally against it. And one, the biggest example right now in front of me is the Saraiki nationalism. Uh, finally, I wanted to conclude on um, in one minute, that how, how do we understand and theorize partition? When I started my doctoral research, my whole proposal was on partition, and then I ended up doing um, something on Saraiki because my supervisor was a Bengali too and could actually understand what Saraiki resistance was all about. But I think the whole concept of partition and divisions has really changed, changed and is changing in Pakistan. There is so much happening. So there is on one side this Punjabi Urdu uh, domination, uh, Urdu meaning Muhajir, Urdu speaking people, and on the other side, the entire of Pakistan. And then Shia Sunni post 9-11 East and East versus West divide, and the current scenario of Talibanization versus non-Talibanization. Thank you very much.